Perform and Code session. I'm Andy Neal, and I'm going to be trying to moderate this. It's the first time I've ever moderated a set of, of panels, so we'll see how well that goes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to briefly introduce our, our panelists, and then I'll let them be. The way this is going to work is they're each going to give a five to some whatever minute presentation. And after that, I have a couple of questions prepared, and then we'll take we'll move it into the audience questions and try to get to that as fast as possible, because that's usually the fun part. Um, here's Zach Gage, who I think I would assume that a lot of you know him because he does make games. Um, Casey Reyes, uh, co-creator of Processing and creator of many beautiful artworks. Uh, Robert Hodgen, um, artist from San Francisco, who was a huge inspiration for the visuals of Osmos, the game that uh, I worked on. Um, and to the far right from my side is uh, Daniel Schiffman, who is a professor at the NYU ITP and is currently working on a <laughs> working on a book called uh, The Nature of Code, which will which is current which has been successfully kickstarted and you could you still support it if you want to? Done through Kickstarter. No, you can come and uh, yeah. tell me your because he has like he's actually putting out prototypes of the chapters that are already amazing. So if you want to look into that, you should probably do that. Anyway, I think uh, Daniel's going to take a Perfect. That's a perfect uh, segue. Uh, hello. Welcome. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Sorry. Welcome. Welcome to me. Uh, welcome to you. Here we are. Um, so I, I, since these are really brief, short presentations, I was just really going to talk about just one thing, uh, which is this uh, book project that I've been working on for quite some time. I only started doing really working on it once. Uh, People gave me some money to do it, so um, I, it, it was more that it was more just the, the guilt now of not finishing it. It's, it's the fear of not finishing it is really is a, is a great motivator. Um, anyway, I'll talk a little bit about the publishing of it in a moment. But so the, the point of this book is so I teach a lot of different programming classes at, at ITP, and one of the classes I teach is Introduction to Programming. And what this book is for is for people who have only had that. And it is saying, I've learned about programming, I've learned about computer graphics, I'm not sure how to look at that over here. Um, but, um, and, uh, but I want to do something more. And what this book does, it says there's a lot of things that happen in our physical world. And can we simulate those things? Uh, and can we simulate those things in code? So most of my students are using this for the purpose of creating all different types of projects, art projects, installation projects, print design projects strange, weird experiments that you can't categorize at all. But uh, one of the things that I'm realizing, I'm um, talking to Andy and different people, is that this uh, book project could also be useful for folks who are programming games, uh, especially 2D games and some of the basic algorithms that you might use to move things around the screen. So um, the book takes a little bit of a, uh, of a journey through. It starts with something really simple, which is what is a vector and what might you use a vector for? And from there, we start looking at modeling motion. Well. What's, what, how does physics work? What is a force? Can we model a force? Um, I have to <laughs> um, We have to, uh, looking at oscillation, something swinging, um, to looking at systems of things. And then, of course, one of the things that I, um, you know, you could do all of this stuff with a physics engine. Well, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Box2D, other um, physics libraries. There's one that's made for processing um, uh, called Toxic Libs, which I also use in the book a lot. Um, but one of the things that I find really valuable and important is even if you're going to use a physics engine, because what you really want is really elaborate intermittent collision detection, and you're never going to spend your life like creating box duty from scratch, but it is really useful to walk through the steps of building your own physics engine, even if you only get so far as a basic set of motion and forces. So we start with this basic idea of simulating physics, and from there, the book moves on to um, looking at, okay, well, what if we add rules to the equation? So what if we said, ah, I have these autonomous agents who can make their own decisions about following a path, about being part of a group crowd, about flocking with flocking elements, um, and looking at different recursive and cellular automata structures for generating patterns. And from there, the book kind of ends with saying, well, you know, we started with just simple motion, then we sort of breathe life into these creatures by allowing them to make their own decisions through a set of rules, and the end of it um, finishes off with trying to give these um, elements a brain. These are really poor, um, uh, demonstration like this is really like a really poor computer. I mean, traditional computer science even that an algorithm producing uh, strings. The little girl that we're deciding uh, which 
uh, if points are on one side of a line or the other. So in the book, hopefully I'll have examples that tie more towards these motion, these motion-based systems. So I've been working on all of these examples. They're all done with processing. They're all, you can get them all off GitHub now, actually. I have a whole set, many, many more examples than I had a few years ago. There are free online tutorials. So I've been trying to put this stuff together into a book, but I, um, I don't, I, writing books is a weird thing. So I wanted to just briefly, I don't know how much time I'm taking. I'm so far. You're good. I'm good, I think I'm talking fast. Um, so I have this other book. Um, it sounds like I'm, oh, oh, I was gonna show something else. Before I get to that, I'm just going to show one example of what some of the students uh, do with this type of material. This has sound, but it's, it's uh, here's the cool. But it's just music playing. You know, it, it's, you know, I, I can just narrate. Right? Um, so um, this is a project called Scrollables. Um, it's uh, this video is still playing. Oh, it's really stuttering. That's sad. Um, it's a project by uh, Filippo Venucci. He's a student I had. Let's see if I can pause. It. Um, and so one of the things that's exciting for me is when, oh, there you go, when, uh, um, and this is a, a, an interface that he built, which is just paper, scrolling paper on wood, and he has sensors built in to determine how the paper is scrolling and then change the way an animation plays. So the reason why I show this is it has some game outputs to it. So this is a playing pong with the scrolling paper, and he used a lot of the stuff from the course to try to create this um, kind of feeling of ink. So there's actual ink, uh, the ink splots on the paper as it's, uh, Around. So one of the things that's really exciting to me, I have these very basic uh, examples, is to see people take them with really creative uses. So to interface them as physical elements, to build their own structures, to, to use them to make games. So that's what I'm kind of excited, if I can ever get this thing finished, to put it out there and see what types of projects come out of it. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk about how I'm publishing it, because I have this other book called Learning Processing, which was uh, I don't know, I'll just say fun to write, but nothing's ever fun to write. But it was, uh, it, it was a, uh, an experience that I was pleased with when it was finished. Um, but uh, the book costs $50. It's like you can't get it anywhere but this big paper thing. And so, um, uh, and also, I, the publisher, they're wonderful people who really meant to work with me and try to create the, um, the, the, the best book possible. But really, honestly, people are finding this book through processing.org or through community word of mouth. So I really find, I really um, was thinking that I don't need a publisher and it would be more exciting to try to produce a book that I could do whatever I want with. I could just be here and be like, hey, I, I printed out some Xerox over there, I'm gonna hand them out. Or, um, I don't know, I, I made a, a, a sculpture version of it that's <laughs> over there in the corner. But, um, so uh, I decided to try to do the projects of Kickstarter, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And so now, um, uh, what I'm excited about is once I get the book finished, I'm looking to try to release it in all formats. A lot of the content for free online. I would like to make an iPad version. I would like to make a PDF version. I would like to make a version that works on Kindle, a print version. Um, and so tangentially this, I just wanted to briefly mention, I'm working on this very top secret project called um, the Magic Book Project. So if, if people are interested in this, stay tuned. I, there's no information about this online, but I'm working with it with some other uh, students and researchers at ITP. And what we're trying to do is create an open source platform for book publishing. So in other words, you don't need to write your book in Microsoft Word, design it in InDesign. You can essentially write your book into a database, and then we will build this giant magic button. When you press the magic button, um, boom, it, the, through software, the book will be auto-generated in all different formats. So it will know if it's making a version for an iPad, it's gonna render the book with HTML5, it's gonna use the JavaScript canvas to show the animations, if it's rendering it for print, it will go to this other directory that has static screenshots in it. So we're trying to create a highly automated system that you don't have to, I find a lot of what I'm doing is copy pasting back and forth between different formats. So the idea is to try to build something and this would be open source and free for anybody who wants to uh, publish their own book across many different formats. So this is, uh, something that I hope uh, will uh, be released along with the book at the same time, somewhere in the beginning of January 2019. Nice. Uh, great, so that's kind of all I have to say okay. for myself. Hello, my name is Robert Hodgson. Uh, 
I am I'm not a teacher anywhere. I'm an independent artist living in San Francisco. And uh, a lot of my inspiration does come from uh, the world of video games, but uh, I'm, I'm much more interested in the, the simulation aspect that you find in video games. So I'm the guy in, you know, playing Uncharted 2, pissed that people are shooting at me because I want to look at the water effects on the swamp level because they're fantastic. So uh, my appreciation of video games tends to be uh, more geared towards uh, figuring out how the environments were rendered or how specific effects were pulled off. So uh, a couple years ago, I did a collaborative piece with um, this cellist named Zoe Keating, and she wanted to do a live 14-minute uh, uh, musical performance, that, and I would provide uh, the visuals for it in real time. Um, prior to working with her, I did this. Um, I did a series of renders based on uh, false memories of Mount Fuji. Uh, and I wanted to create a reasonable train engine that I could populate with plants and water and uh, flocking animals, and it had to all run in real time. So uh, it ended up being a very difficult <coughs> experience for me because I didn't have much of a background doing these things. So it was a lot of trial and error. And this original version was done in processing. And uh, the final piece, she has some audio, but I'm not So the challenge for me when working on this was trying to figure out things like, is it hard to see that one? Maybe I can adjust the again, is that something I should do? So uh, the final installation um, was uh, one application running in real time off of a souped up PC so that I could get as many particles in as possible. Uh, and this camera just moved randomly about this 3D space. Uh, and in the background you see uh, Mount Fuji, but you never see it clearly. It's always partially obscured by plant life uh, or fog because uh, the memory I'm basing this particular piece off of was as a child uh, visiting and climbing part of Mount Fuji with my family. Uh, and it was really foggy, and we stopped at this stand where my father bought a, a nice walking stick. Um, and I mentioned this to my mother uh, decades later, and she just sort of laughed at me, because uh, I was remembering being in a park in Tokyo. We hadn't actually ever gone to visit Mount Fuji, but you know, <laughs> so, somehow that memory morphed into something really awesome. So I decided to make this piece based on that uh, a completely fabricated experience. So that engine I ended up using for this live collaboration with, uh, with Zoe, and if I can remember all the keyboard inputs. Um, so there's a there's a generic skybox which wraps this whole scene. It's currently night. Um, you might go to see stars and random floating dust particles. The occasional shooting star will pass by, but as the piece uh, progresses, and I'm in control of the, the camera movements, and I'm able to populate the scene, uh, a path appears, which the camera is traveling down. Um, I ran this off of a much faster PC, so that I did have this nice grass layer effect, but I'm going to keep it turned off while it's running on my on my, uh, my Mac laptop. Eventually, the sun rises, uh, and it starts to get really bright. I went crazy with the bloom effects. Um, and then as the, uh, the piece starts to pick up uh, energy, I start to populate it with uh, these boulders that come up out of the ground and then eventually uh, fill the scene with a bunch of redwoods. The music works really well with this. <laughs> uh, so for about 14 minutes, I'm sitting there on, you know, at a keyboard controlling the camera and trying to sync uh, this generative growth with the, the audio that Zoe's playing. And we performed it at the San Jose Biennial uh, earlier this year. Uh, maybe it was last year, it's been a while. Uh, and it did really well. It was a fun project to work on because it made me realize just how little I know about doing uh, a nice, realistic train simulation. Uh, I cut a lot of corners with this particular version, but it's definitely the source of, of most of my recent work is trying to get better at doing train stuff. Um, for a while earlier this year, I worked with this company, uh, Bloom, out of San Francisco, who's um, 
trying to find ways to combine video game aesthetic with doing data visualizations, and I worked with them in creating an iPad app that was a uh, sort of alternate way to visualize your um, your, your music library on your iPad. Worked earlier, so I'm optimistic. Uh, it's called Planetary, and. Um, So uh, this project began by looking at all the artists that you have in your uh, music library on the iPad, and every artist is represented as a star in this system, and you can filter uh, by first letter. You can also choose to filter by playlist, which I don't have many of. And then once you select an artist, or once you filter it down, you select which artist you want, and you zoom in to see that artist's star, and the star will have planets orbiting, and each planet represents an album by that artist. So we choose the Peel Sessions. Zoom in to planet level, and you see that it has a bunch of moons. Each moon represents a song that's on that album. The speed at which the, uh, the moon orbits is uh, related to how long the track is. So you have some of these um, uh, sort of audience reaction. You know, which is only about 10 seconds, so that particular moon forming really, really quickly. And uh, you can also scrub through the simulation. But the, the parts that I sort of got really lost in while making this was um, I, I wanted to do realistic um, simulation effects, like uh, if you pass the planet in front of the the sun, you get a nice eclipse effect, which then showcases the uh, uh, sort of Milky Way haze in the background. And also, it's kind of hard to see, you probably won't be able to see it on the projection, but there's a, there's a cast shadow from each planet onto the accretion disk around the system. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's been my focus, is I love, I love trying to find ways to use math to simulate things that we experience in our day to day. Uh, and so I had a great deal of fun working on this app. It's a free download, so there's no reason not to get it. It runs much better on the iPad 2 than it does the iPad 1. Uh, and um, you know, load up your iPad with a bunch of music and, and explore. Oh, uh, you can also adjust the, uh, the scale and speed of the simulation if you choose to.
a very brief way. Here's Sketchpad, again from the 19, early, six, early 1960s, one of the first CAD systems. Talk about uh, how different technologies affect the graphics in an interesting way. So here you can see the top, the simulation of running on an oscilloscope versus the bottom, early Atari, and sort of how the platform affects um, the, the graphics of, of, of playing. And then talking about repetition, here's another early one, 1963, from Frieder Nake, showing a use of um, repetition and random values to produce a composition. Transformation as a strategy. We go through different techniques, like slit scanning, for example. Uh, talk about the potential of those. We also have examples at the end of each chapter. So here you can see an example of slit scanning, an example of taking an image and then taking the gray values of each pixel and then using that to extrude out into three dimensions. So the book really covers the basics, basic techniques, and then has examples to support them. Parameterization, the other thing it does is it really tries to take these themes and show how they apply across a range of different fields. So here's a, the Fair Tower, which is a building designed for Paris by Morphosis, local Los Angeles based architects. And it shows how code was used for optimizing um, the sort of different forms in the building and also optimizing it for um, sort of the, the heating and cooling of the building. So code and parameterization is used for functional reasons as well. Uh, we also try and make links to the history of art. So for example, um, this Alexander Calder sculpture is a, an amazing example of a composition system where you have different parameters that, that affect how it moves and changes in time. I'm trying to make those links back and forth. Um, one other example is parameterization. Um, here, people are building custom 3D engines and custom simulation engines for modeling in a really specific and precise way. So the book then goes on to talk about simulation visualization. I want to briefly talk about processing, which is a programming language that I co-founded with Ben Fry one decade ago. Um, this map shows where it fits in you know, to the family of languages. Uh, some exciting things coming out of it now are processing JS, which is a way of exporting from this application to things that will run online um, in HTML5 and with WebGL, and also um, Android processing for running on tablets and mobile applications. But you can see it kind of, it comes from C++ and Java, influenced by these early graphical languages. And really the point of processing is this idea that we believe that um, all designers, all visual artists, should have a basic experience with learning how to program. Um, should get um, that direct, first-hand experience as a way of understanding software as a medium deeper than when you're just working with tools. So I want to show two code examples here. This is what processing looks like. It's a really simple, sort of reduced, minimal um, IDE. And I'm going to show this example from Golan Levin called Yellowtail. Is an example of a performance system that's all generated entirely with code. So I generate a gesture, then that gesture repeats. So if I move really fast, that repeats. If I make a slow piece like that, it moves slowly. So using code as a way of generating performance and kinetic and animated um, graphics. The other example I want to show is by Jared Tarbell. This one's called Substrate. And this one is purely generative. So we have a, a really simple rule. And when that rule is then applied and runs in time, you see uh, sort of how it manifests itself in a way that is sort of unexpected when you know the sim the, how simple the rule is. So as this one runs, I think you can get a sense of what the rule is. You're, you're a line and you're moving straight. When you hit a wall or hit another line, you then branch off um, to create two other lines perpendicular on either side of yourself. And over time, that one really basic um, property begins to develop this larger, more complicated texture landscape. So processing, I think the reason it's interesting is because it allows you to work with many different elements and also hook into a lot of different existing systems. So here you can see a few examples. This is just a diagram showing the use of processing on a, on a uh, monthly, sorry, weekly basis. You can see this, this is how it's tied into education. So um, here we have the summers, and then here we have holiday, like winter holiday. <laughs> um, one thing about processing relating to education is we have been um, working on a lot of different ways of teaching. So there's online tutorials, which is something that Dan puts a lot of energy into. And then I kind of live a, live a parallel life to Dan on different coasts. So he's in New York teaching all the time, working, developing, processing. I'm in Los Angeles doing a similar thing. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the approach to teaching programming, which is radically different to how programming is taught in computer science programs. 
So you can see this is spread from the book. It shows that the book's about one-third code, one-third images, and one-third prose. And for every small piece of code in the book, we have images that correspond to it. So you learn the exact same thing that you learn in a CS department. You learn about variables, you learn about making code modular with functions and objects, but it's, you start from day one making graphics, rather than just working with data structures and text. Um, Dan, me, um, other folks, kind of like, gener like uh, collectively building this alternative um, computer science um, education with building a, a, a uh, culture of programming within the arts. So you can see, for example, here we start by drawing, we work on interaction, working with media and motion, but then we also hit on the major topics of computer science as well. Now I want to blow through a few examples of my own visual work. Um, this is a commission that I finished last January in uh, Miami, Florida, in Miami Beach. This is a new Frank Gehry building that opened, and uh, myself and Tal Rosener were commissioned to do this mural, which is all um, generative photographic murals built from code. And um, we spent about a year and a half going there every few months and taking photos of the building while it was being built. And then um, these compositions are then, generative photo compositions are projected back onto the building. So the way that works, the way we were able to produce 365 unique composition was um, building this system in code where basically we have this really basic XML format. We take these um, pieces of images and then um, use this to tune the final variables. Here's another example of the code system. Here you can see more of what it looks like running on the building, and here's the, the monster 4HD projectors that actually put it onto the building itself. Um, also through these slides, I wanna show how um, code has agency in the world beyond just the screen, um, beyond pixels. And so I tried to pick some of my examples that, that move into the world in different formats. This is a 48 foot by 11 foot mural um, that was commissioned for a building at MIT. These are some garments that I um, made with my wife. Um, she's the fashion designer, I produce the patterns. These are some relief sculptures that were generated from one of my pieces of software. And then this is a, um, an installation where on these disks, these are all um, live software processes all running um, and being projected down into the space. So that's the, the shotgun approach to five minute talk. And I'll move on to Zach. Basically everything and just trying to experiment and make these 
um, generative images and like substrate was one of the things um, that like was just so inspiring when I was first getting into that. Um, and then I kind of moved very quickly into building these like interactive objects and installations, sort of online and offline. And this has kind of taken up what uh, most of my artistic exploration has been um, up through now, which is sort of looking at this weird situation of humanity and how we're like super engaged with technology and we're kind of starting to live in the internet and what that means and examining that the systems that that creates and uh, trying to then build systems that pose questions based on like all these little rules that I'm discovering about how we behave. Um, and uh, and I, I'm just like gonna totally breeze over that portion of my life kind of for this talk. So I'm just showing this one really, really lightweight piece, which is I was trying to think about how like we all use the internet and we're all connected to each other all the time, but still like people are lonely all the time and loneliness is a problem and there's this like weird idea of like we're networks but we're lonely. There's network loneliness and I was thinking about like building like a like a robot or something like that for people who are lonely um, not like a sexual robot for people who are lonely, like, a, like some kind of like emotionally lonely so I was thinking about what that could be and I kind of I built this like really quick little thing of like I thought like lonely people don't get to like wave when they come home so I built this like, this robot that would just wave at you and it was connected to your computer um, so so that, that's like the kind of stuff and it, it, it gets a little bit heavier and more emo and in the rest of my work, but I'm going to skip that. Um, I had longer hair then. So uh, I'm going to kind of skip that though because what ended up happening is I, I in, in doing that exploration, I kind of started to make a lot of software um, that would sort of encourage specific types of behavior or let you explore certain things. And I started to kind of flip this artistic exploration on its head. So before, and, and still you know, on the side, I, I was looking at systems in the world and kind of figuring out how to describe them and like what the weird rules were in that system. And then I would take those rules and I would follow them to a different conclusion. And it would be weird or funny or depressing and that's what I would make the, the piece with. But then I kind of started changing that and thinking about like, well, what if instead of doing that, what if I built a system for other people and, and they could explore it? And like, what would that need to include? Um, what if I can sort of change this, this form that I was creating to not one that's dis describing something, but one that's showing something. Um, and so I made this thing called SynthPod, and I originally did it on the computer. Um, and then, and it's like basically just a visual music system. I love music, but I don't understand notes. So um, this was like a way for people who are purely visual to create music. And I'm not going to describe it so much, but essentially, I made it on the computer, and it worked pretty well, but no one really played with it at all. And then the App Store came out, and I was like, oh, that might be interesting. Like, maybe it will even feel better as like a touch thing. And I did it, and it like kind of took off. And I was really like enamored with this kind of development program. Um, and so then I kind of remembered that like when I was little, I really wanted to make video games, and I started trying it. Um, and so I made this game called Unify, and I, and I wanted to show it, and also the next one, Houseman, which is here, because it's. It's really different than the work that I was doing before. It's, it doesn't have like that complexity of the, the systems that I was designing to generate 2D images, but what it does have um, is it still has that sort of feeling um, of, of code artwork. It's just a lot less complex. And it's the same sort of thing with Halcyon. Like you can kind of imagine this as being like a generated code system. And but it's simple. And, the fact that it's simple is actually really important because what I discovered when I was kind of trying to create these things for people is that when you have a really, really simple system, it really aids in how people understand it. And not just understand it, but how people explore it. And so when you can keep all the rules in your head for a system, you can get really deep in it, way deeper than you could get where you don't really understand what's going on. Um, and so when I built these systems, the art was on one hand generated um, from the code, but it's also generated in such a way that it's supposed to give you sort of an extended understanding of the system. And you can kind of tell here, like if I had put up a shot of like Halo or, or something like that, when you look at those, you, you start thinking about the narrative and you're like, oh, you know, what's that gun mean? And why are these aliens shaped this way? What's going on? But when I put this up, you're forced to think about the system and you're forced to kind of wonder what kind of game this is and what's actually happening here. Um, and, and that, to me, and I think that this is something that's like kind of coming back in games. I think this is something that we used to do a lot with board games, like chess and go and whatnot, because those games are really all about the systems, and you're forced to deal with the system because you're creating and enforcing the rules, and that might 
makes you need to know. Um, but it's starting to come back, and, and Tetris was kind of like that. But it's, anyway, it's starting to come back with like the Bit Trip series and like Drop Seven and Osmos and Desktop Dungeons and all the stuff that John Blow is talking about with these like finding these truths and systems. Um, and so that's like a really exciting thing for me. Um, so I wanted to kind of show some new stuff since a lot of people who don't hang out with me haven't seen this and have been kind of underground for a while. Um, so this is a, a puzzle game that I've been working on and it kind of has that same kind of thing. It's like, there's, it's, it's not really designed particularly to be beautiful and it, and it may look very different from this when it actually gets released, but the, the beauty in it is kind of coming from the system behind it and, and what the gameplay actually is and what that forces the puzzles to look like. Um, and it also helps you understand how the game is being played. Um, and also I've been working um, with one of my friends who's sort of not in this space, he's more of like a casual designer, on a bunch of new games, and this is all programmer art, this and the next one, it will not look like this at all. Um, but this game, so totally different aesthetic, but it's still very much in line with the stuff I'm designing, because what this game is, is it's a roguelike solitaire game. And if you guys are familiar with those, they're both very strongly systemic games, and they both kind of, Solitaire is a game where you lose all the time and it's crazy hard, and rogues are, roguelikes are a game where you lose all the time and are really hard, and this is sort of a combination of both. Um, but the really important thing about it is you literally cannot play it unless you understand all the rules. And the better you understand the rules, the more likely you are to survive, and then you kind of reach this tipping point where you really understand how the system works and how everything is interacting, and then suddenly you survive after you've played like 50 games. Um, and it's like a really exciting moment. And I think doing games like this is both really interesting to me, but also really economical as an indie developer because a system is an easy thing to design because it's in my head and I can just make it up, whereas assets and stuff get really complicated. Um, so here's another one, and this one is also really designy and programmer already. And this is like going to be impossible to explain in 30 seconds, but it's sort of a cross between chess and Starcraft and Sudoku. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a warring game, so it's like two players and you're collecting resources. But the really big trick in this game and where we got it from Sudoku is no column or row can have more than one piece of its own type in it. And so whether that's yours or your opponent's. So on this board that we have laid out, you'll notice that no row has two of the things, two of any single piece in it. So no row has two two walls or two swordsmen, even if they're different colors. And that kind of allows you to get these extraordinarily complex situations out of this very simple rule set because all of the units are serving so many purposes when you lay them down. And so even though it doesn't really look anything like the other stuff, if I go back and look at this kind of mock-up of when we were designing it and when we have numbers in it, suddenly it seems like the system again. It's all mathy and it has this like very code and form thing, even though we did it um, on paper. And so I guess I just wanted to say that like, for me, like, where, um, where I feel like the meaning in this panel topic and what's going to be awesome when these guys talk and we kind of have a conversation is that for me, like, code is sort of more than our tool. It happens to be our tool because we're programmers and we're making digital things. But it's also this weird thing that it's like a tangible manifestation of the rules of a system. It's, it's used to simultaneously create and bring into reality what we're doing, but it's also used to control uh, like a conceptual situation, one that's explored and exploited by the people who are in it. And so it's kind of the unity that merges what we see, what we feel, how we understand, and how we actually physically make these spaces. And to me, that like union of everything, when all that stuff fits together, that's sort of like the most beautiful thing about designing systems and merging this form and code thing. So, thanks.
to your style, to your voice, and how, how your composition process works? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, of a hybrid in that I went to a science and math school for high school and decided that I liked art. And after I graduated, I took some time off and learned how to paint and do some illustration. And then I applied to go to RISD, which at the time was the number one design school in the nation. Um, and I decided that I really liked science. <laughs> I wasted, you know, a good eight years of education because I kept changing my mind as to what I liked. But, <laughs> well, I think it put me in a position where, um, uh, where I can, uh, I have a, a definite aesthetic voice because I was interested in the arts at, at a certain point in my life and studied them and also have a, a, a decent science background. I'm not an expert in either one. I'm, you know, I'm kind of the jack of all trades when it comes to uh, science and art. But um, having both of those influences definitely um, shaped the type of aesthetic I tend to settle on. Uh, and I usually just get there from lots of trial and error. I, I often don't know what I'm doing, and it's, it's a lot of um, dealing with, with failures after failures until you find something that starts to work, and then you pursue that for a while. Um, well, I mean, one thing that I think that I see definitely with a lot of students who are first starting out is it's very easy to think you're going to start with the whole. So you have this sort of fantasy for this giant project that you've laid out and planned in your head. And as much as you can understand that conceptually, you might be able to sketch it or explain it to somebody, but if you start to program something, you have to build it up with little, lots of little systems. So you need to say, if you think of Robert's work, you need to say, well, what is it to make one single tree? What is it to make one single blade of grass? What is it to make... Uh, one mountain, <laughs> but um, so uh, what, what are these? Uh, and, and to understand how to um, that you don't need to know the end when you're at the beginning. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to have a, a goal or a sense of what you're doing, but to be able to build these lots of and one of the things that I often require students to do is to make you know make 20 small sketches and don't try to make one big project because it's about sort of putting lots of little pieces together. Yeah, you know, I think like I would characterize it as like an explorative process rather than an explicitly construction process. So I, at least for me, a lot of projects start from just thinking about like, well, what if I had these two rules? Like, what if I have a system where this thing orbits this thing, and you can flick the first one and it moves? What would that look like? And what kind of, how can I explore that space? And like once you have it, if it's interesting, then you kind of ask another question. You're like, all right, well that works. What if they both drew lines? And then maybe that doesn't work, and then you take a step back and try something else. With, with a lot of the work, it's um, dealing with emergent systems as well. So it's not something you really can design at the, at the outset. It's something you, you more you discover it in the process of working, and then you, you tune it from there. Uh, but also, one thing I've noticed is that um, if, you, if you learn how to be a visual artist, and you also learn how to be a programmer, um, that doesn't mean you can sort of be a visual artist who programs. Actually, Putting the two together is a whole other learning process. And so I think that's, that's something interesting I've seen over the years. So yeah, so to me that sounds uh, inherently bottom-up. Bottom like most of the, like it's more bottom-up than top-down process in that case, because you don't know the end result, right. essentially. Okay, so it's black magic, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one more for me is uh, based on your, so, so the interesting parallel I see here with all the panelists is that you all more or less work on tools that you use to make your form, to create your form, instead of relying on existing tools. I mean, I guess you know, Zach, you, you didn't make open frameworks, but you still you work on it. You, know, you constantly have feel the need to build it. And for me, uh, not having asked you this, I would just think it's like, you might, how best do you feel in this? I guess for Casey, it's a different ball game to make a programming language. But uh, I just wanted to know about the origins of how that came to be, like how do you felt this desire to make your own tools for, for your phone. I'll just start first. I mean, when we started processing 10 years ago, um, that was a really different time. That was when Java applets were the, were the most exciting future. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was when I was graduating and I was starting to teach. And um, in order to teach programming, we felt we needed like a general language that also, once you learned it, you could branch into other related languages. Um, and so we, we sort of picked that uh, processing because we didn't feel that anything really fit that at the moment. And so that's really essentially why we, 
we made it. The other reason we made it was because we needed what we what we called at that time um, a language to sketch within. I mean, you have like programming languages are really meant for optimi optimization of speed and scripting languages. And for doing this graphics work, we, we thought that we needed something kind of in between on the line. So we needed to write the programs in a faster, more adept way than writing C++. But we, we, at that time, we couldn't deal with how slow um, the programs would be running in Python. And so we picked this sort of middle approach that made it fast to write. And then the programs would run fast enough for what we needed to do. And that was a sort of middle ground that didn't exist. So we follow those two reasons and sort of design towards that spec. Uh, I used processing for maybe about five years, and I'd probably still be using processing today if I hadn't met uh, Andrew Bell, who is the person behind uh, the Cinder C++ framework, which is what I've been using lately. He and I both worked at Barbarian Group at the same time, and I kept going. I knew he was a computer science nerd with Computer Camp and did all that, uh, and he understood coding from a point of view that I couldn't even come close to approaching. And I would ask him all these Java-related processing questions. How would you do this? And he would say, Well, I kind of have an idea, but if you, you know, if you switch to Cinder and learn C++, then I could definitely help you. And he's the reason I'm not even using processing anymore, is because I knew I could get better instruction from someone who was sitting, you know, right there in the same room with me. Uh, and you know, since then, I've, I'm starting to help contribute back to the Cinder code base and helping to promote it. Um, but Without, without, without processing, I'd probably still be in the world of you know, making Flash websites. And uh, I'm thankful to have an opportunity to work on a framework to see how it all comes together. And it's been very So it's the science side again. Yes. Great. My background. Um, yeah. And I guess, I guess with open frameworks, it's sort of a similar kind of thing. Like I, I guess I sort of came to it and helped work on it out of necessity for wanting to work on my iPhone. And Open Frameworks has was this program that's or this language framework that in C that's kind of been in development for a while, and I wanted to see it on the iPhone, and so I met with a couple people and we worked on that. And it was just I think it, it kind of comes down to like when you're making work in this bottom-up way, you just cannot plan out everything you're going to do, and so being able to make a change, hit compile, and see what happens is really important. And that's not generally what programming languages are designed to do. Um, and I guess probably a lot of people in here use game frameworks like Game Maker and Unity and stuff like that, and those are also really good. But when you're, I don't know, for me coming from like a creative coding background, those things always felt really restrictive, and it's just nice to have like a really flat playing field where I can just do what I want, and I have a lot of help to do it. And it's fast. Okay, so we have another. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, sure. I mean, these guys have really, in a lot of ways, have said it all. I mean, one thing that I that I would add to that maybe is, you know, I find teaching one of the reasons to teach is because it's really the only time that I feel like I really learn. That's how I learn stuff. So you sort of sign up like, I don't know if I know that, but just put me down for that class, and then it really forces you. It's a lot different to. Uh, it's a. It's a there's a different sort of threshold of what you need to understand and prepare for if you're going to teach something versus I just kind of like got it working and it's there and I can turn this project in. I don't really, don't touch it because I don't know what's going on underneath. So I think for me, working on tools has a lot of the same reward there. So to really kind of get into it, I, I, I used to say uh, that I learned, how, you know, all, basically all I know about programming from just like looking through the processing source code. It's like, uh, how does that work in computer graphics? I'll just go look it up in the processing source code. So being, being able to contribute to that and be a part of that, I think really um, is exciting. And, Great. Can I say one more thing? One thing about that all these tools share in common, as far as I know, we're all really friendly with each other, um, <laughs> is, that, is that they're all um, open source tools made by artists for making their own work. And it's a really different approach than like picking up a, a, a framework that was written for computer science or for writing applications in C++ um, and sort of using it for making visual work. And it's also because they're they're being tailored and sort of customly built by people who are actively working on working on pieces. Mm -hmm. And also through the open source component, we're actually, I know for a fact, we're sharing source code and algorithms between all the projects as well. Uh, so those are exciting differences. Rather than using uh, a piece of software that was made by sort of a team of engineering and marketers because they think that's what we, we want to do. Well, this is actually used to parallel with our next speaker, Adam Saltzman, who uh, had a, a similar process working on Flexel, which is his, essentially, I guess, I'm going to probably get this all wrong and correct me wrong, but he made a bunch of games and he saw like some overarching structure in his code and he realized that if you extract that and give it back to the 
And then since that was out and it's open source, many, many people use it. So, okay, so we have another 15 minutes ish. I am going to hand it off to the audience and uh, please ask away. Somebody's hand away in the back. How does the structure of the language you use affect your art? So instead of being like, I have an art idea, I want to build it in my framework, it's more like the art evolves because of the framework you're using. Sorry, too late. In, in our case, the framework evolves because we want to do something the framework doesn't do at the moment. So meaning the processing always kind of grows in fits and spurts because um, we have, we, we have an idea for a project that doesn't really support, and so that's kind of, we extend the framework to do that. And the other is that, um, I think the most interesting thing about processing is that it has hundreds of libraries that extend it, um, that have been written by the community and contributed back. And that allows the project to grow based on need and, and independence um, from the core development. And, but then once that happens, then it sort of snowballs and other people are able to, to utilize and do things that it couldn't happen before. So it, it really grows by need rather than vice versa. Maybe. <laughs> but I, but maybe. Maybe. that we're all kind of using 
and you can use it to kind of explore whatever you want. And, and if you mix those questions up, um, like sometimes you ask questions about sound, and sometimes you ask questions about visuals, and sometimes you ask questions about interactivity, and you just blend them all together and slowly figure it out, then you can kind of approach that stuff in a, in a bottom-up way. I know that sort of sounds like black magic. <laughs> okay, another question over here. Yeah, so as you talk about uh, you know, asking small questions and, and try this and try that, um, obviously some things don't work, so how much, uh, and was it a huge reality check to find out that you had to you know, quote unquote throw away a lot of stuff and, and how much do you find yourself uh, trying and having to just, oh well, I just spent a bunch of time and it's not a good idea. And do you find that time decreasing with experience? <laughs> or is that too big? Should I narrow it down? No, I, I, I think that's a really good question. Yeah, for me, the, the, that, that process of, of doing that, that sort of unknown search is I enjoy just as much as doing the final tuning and polishing. So I, I write a lot of code that no one ever sees other than myself, and, but I, don't, I see that as being a great pleasure rather, rather than a waste of time. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, would, I would not characterize it as a waste of time. More yeah. of a, a question on quantity. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that like I still end up throwing as much stuff away The changes um, how fast I am at generating the stuff that I'm going to throw away. So like now that those are kind of weird. Um, like and I and that may also be part of the reason why a lot of us are or we're all using open source languages that we're building because you know your brain gets on a certain path and you're asking a bunch of questions in one area and you build the tools to make that easier and then you can sort of play that out um, and then it's not so bad to make stuff and throw it out. But I actually think that's the most interesting part. I hate polishing. <laughs> I like putting that. Yeah. No, I guess not. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we have time for. Can we take two more? Yeah. Uh, so, as someone who is a big fan of all these frameworks and have worked with all of them, uh, if there's any particular project where you want to use it, uh, so if I want something that runs on the web or something that is easily cross platform, I'll use processing. If it's something that uh, doing a lot of image processing, like the speed bump of C++, all the different frameworks that are there. Do you guys find that you use, I mean, you're all contributors to one specific uh, framework, but do you use other frameworks for different projects where that tool seems to make more sense than the one that you are specifically dedicated to? I, I used to split my time between processing and Cinder uh, because all, all my work was in processing, and so I was slowly porting over the bits that I knew that I needed to but I'm pretty, I'm pretty much exclusive to Cinder now, so simply because it's become the thing that I'm more comfortable with. Um, I miss the the, the 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 glory days of, of really quick sketch making and processing, and it's something I'm coming to terms with. Trying to make more template uh, programs that I can just you know, duplicate and start a new sketch, but processing them is a lot easier, um, and I do miss some of that. Uh, but um, I, I'm pretty exclusive. <laughs> I mean, for me, most of my work these days involves teaching and writing tutorials, so in that sense, I tend to use processing for that because it, it is the platform that I find the most accessible, especially for beginners. Um, but um, it, it really depends. There's a course that, I, uh, that you're familiar with, Matt, uh, that I teach, which, uh, where the uh, students create these projects for a very large video wall in New York City. And in that sense, in that course, we, we pick and choose from what makes sense. I always say that somebody should feel free to use PowerPoints if they want to. But nobody, nobody has yet. But, um, so I think I think uh, having a mixed approach can be can be good. But you know, it's 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 often important, especially when you're beginning or learning, to sort of find the place that. I mean, my answer is the same, and the same as your approach. Um, I use at times I've used Action Script, and um, uh, I use processing most, and at times I've used open frameworks as well. It just depends on what the final platform is and what the project is. And I would say most of the time I stick with open frameworks. I think because open frameworks and their processing are kind of very closely related, and so there's not a lot of reason to jump between them when you're really comfortable. But I do use like tons of other programming languages, like PHP and Python, sometimes it's for or sometimes. I mean, and I really depends on, you know, there are programming languages that are just much better for 
my, my questions. Hi. Uh, my question is really short and simple. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of the panelists. What is just one of your favourite video games, and why do you like it? Self-serving. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not fishing. You can't say Uncharted. You know, you know his answer. You know my answer. We've talked about it already. Uh, I, just one of your favorites. One, well, I will say Uncharted 2 was... You love that! But for something I talked about earlier, it just that the environments are really lovely rendered. You screw all the gameplay elements and... <laughs> it's, it's a really beautiful thing to walk around in, but um, more on the indie side, I think um, Flow and Flower had a strong impact on me because it was nice to see games that were um, engaging and immersive that didn't rely on violence being the, the core structure. Um, very fond of, of both of those. I, I'm going to pick uh, Myth of the Fallen Words. Uh, <laughs> just because it's, it harkens back to a time in my life where I would stay up all night with roommates playing this game. You know. um, so uh, I, I, I like a lot of the early Bungie games. I've played a lot of those. And, uh, since then, I haven't had as much time. <laughs> A big Space Eggs, which is an Apple II game, and it was kind of a Space Invaders ripoff, but it had great um, kind of generative graphics effects with the, the aliens. And it's one of the few that I haven't been able to found, find um, emulated, and so I, I don't have a, a new memory of playing it, I only have the <laughs> ten-year-old memory of playing it. Um, I, there are so many, but uh, I would have to probably pick um, Ellis by Steph Durian. I, that game is just so astonishingly beautiful and systemic, and everything just works, and it's intuitive and weird and open. So, yeah, I was gonna pick that one too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one to pick. It's kind of I think if I made a game, that would I think it would be that would be what I was aspire to make. What would be your answer? Oh, I I've uh, got. Too many. I maybe Alice. I mean, I love. Alice. <laughs> 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 I'm glad I said it first. <laughs> 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 it's you. Okay, I think uh, I'm gonna wrap it up here. We get ready for uh, Adam's talk at uh, four o'clock. So let's thank our panelists.